we are ready to start this. And I have to remember that there's a 30 second delay. So all of you that are listening to me are listening to me 30 seconds after I start talking. So the time isn't exactly seven o'clock for you. And it's not exactly seven o'clock for me. So we're just gonna move with what we got. I'd like to welcome all of you to Stop the Confusion webinar of July 28th, 2015. I want to welcome you all to the worldwide webinar of Stop the Confusion, and I want to talk to you about what I'm going to be doing in this webinar. Um, I'm going to start off right away with two questions. The reason for that is you guys are here on time, and I want to honor that. I love being on time. I hate just uh, waiting around. I also like to dive right in and get you all excited because... I have a bunch of questions here that people have asked me, and I want to get you into it right away. Uh, then after a couple of questions, I'm going to introduce everyone to who I am. A lot of you already know me, but some of you have never met me before. And I want to describe to you who I am and what my practice is all about. And then we're going to just go through a whole bunch of questions, and then I'm going to do a follow-up, a wrap-up. Uh, this whole presentation is free because I just have a passion for talking about horses. My practice has been limited just to dentistry, but I've been a horseman for a long time, but we'll get in that in a, in a, in a little bit. All right, <clears throat> one of the questions I got um, before this webinar was this one right here. In the last webinar, you demonstrated a breakaway, did not very well. Could you demonstrate that again a bit more slowly and close up? <clears throat> The answer is kind of yes and kind of no. I'm going to put this video back on and we're going to play it in its entirety, which is about three or four minutes. And then afterwards, I'm going to go over it one more time. So here's a video. This is how I like to do a quick release knot. A horse that starts pulling on a rope needs to be released quickly and effortlessly. Here the horse is pulling, it's bunched up, she reaches up and bingo, you're released. But here's the secret. Never pass the whole rope through. Just put a loop through. You see how that's just looped there? Now you crisscross from right to left. Here's uh, a loop. All right, I just stopped the video, and I'm going to pay for that dearly because I can't go back to where it was. But that is the secret to this uh, video, to this uh, tying up a horse. Everyone I see takes the rope and passes it around or through a loop, around a post or something. And the problem with that is you now have a physical obstacle that is between you and the horse. So when the horse starts to go backwards, um, huh, that's my wife. She just chimed in. She has a microphone on, but um, now it's off. That's good. Anyway, the, when, when you pass a loop through, don't pass it all the way through. You see how I folded that loop of rope up. So now it's, it's just a portion of it put through, and we're going to tie that together. So that's the secret. I want you to see that again as we put it in slow motion. You can do this to a ring, which is the best thing. You can do it to a post or whatever. But when a horse starts pulling backwards and you do your quick release, the last thing you want to do is have the rope tied around something so it ends up pulling whatever that is off the wall. You want to make sure that it's uh, free and clear to go. So let's watch this. This is how I like to do a quick release knot. A horse that starts pulling on a rope needs to be released quickly and effortlessly. Here the horse is pulling. It's bunched up. She reaches up and bingo, you're released. But here's the secret. Never pass the whole rope through. Just put a loop through. You see how that's just looped there? Now you crisscross from right to left. Here's uh, a loop. Uh, formed by going to the right of the uh, horse attached to the rope. Now she's passing to the other side and pulling it through and making another loop. So it's being braided back and forth. That adds a little bit more friction. And now she's going to do one more loop. And then she's going to take her left hand and pull that tight. Now with her right hand in just a second, she's going to pull as if the horse is pulling. Now here the horse is pulling and it's trying to get away. And it bunches up. That's no big deal. It's tight. The horse can't go anywhere. Now with the right hand, she just reaches up and pulls. And presto, the horse is completely released and no longer attached to anything in the barn. All right, I hope that helps explain that. Uh, it just takes practice. You put your loop through, and then you braid. So one side goes, if you have the free side, it goes on one side of the horse-attached um, rope. 
and then you go to the other side uh, of the horse attached rope and you put another loop through it and you just go back and forth two or three or four times and you're all set and it's just a great way to tie a horse up so hopefully that answers that question really dynamically all right this is another one it's actually not a question but a plea to reiterate all you said on deworming deworming is one of my passions I talk about everywhere I go so uh, Oh, okay. I'm just I'm I got Matt texting me and, and he said my audio kind of went out, but that could have been because of the video. All right. So um I want to talk about parasites a little bit more. She um this person who asked the question did just what I had said to the entire herd, and the difference in their parents is jaw dropping. Artie, who's one of her horses, is simply spectacular now. I'm humbled and appalled at generally twice yearly recommendation now. And what the problem is, people just don't know what deworming is. No one's talked to anybody about parasites. So let me give you a brief thing here. First, this is a picture I saw of a horse uh, the other day that has um, what I call worm hairs. And what's really cool is, and unfortunately, you can't see my cursor. Let me see if I can do, there's this thing here where I can draw. And this is going to be so much fun because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, oh well, I'm just trying to draw and it's, that's not working. All right, so we'll just go back to what's going on. But these long stringy hairs that are in the throat latch area and a horse that's somewhat shed out, but these hang in there, you can grab them with your fingers and you pull on the bottom of their neck and they don't come out. In fact, the horse actually is irritated by you pulling them. Those are what I call worm hairs. And if your horse has that in April, in April or so, or even May or June, that means your horse has parasites as far as I'm concerned. Now let me ask you a question, and this is going to start off the discussion, but how often did your parents deworm you? And a lot of people just don't understand this concept. But here's a picture of Reese's Pinworm Medicine, treatment for pinworms with parental pamoid suspension. Now, parental pamoid suspension is strongid tea. It's a liquid form of strongid that we give dogs, cats, and horses. And this is on my local Walgreens pharmacy shelf. I couldn't believe it. I picked it up and just took a picture of it. It's right there. I uh, don't need a prescription at all. And the strongid and ivermectin are approved for use in humans. So if they're approved for use in humans, there's got to be a reason for that. And the number one reason is you and I don't eat where we defecate. And as, as gross as that sounds, think about it for a second. Knives and forks came out a long time ago to keep our manure uh, fingered hands, our dirty fingers, away from our mouth. Knives and forks came out before we had running water and soap. That's a relatively new concept, maybe a hundred years old, that we have running water in our homes and a bar of soap. Now we're washing our hands constantly for fear of germs and viruses going around. But a hundred years ago, we were worried about parasites. So. We have a septic system, and that's where we go to the bathroom, and we eat at our dining room table with clean hands and knives and forks, and that's why we don't treat ourselves with uh, uh, dewormers. So the key point about deworming is cleanliness. You must be clean. And the second is frequency of deworming. And a lot of people think that once a year, twice a year, or every eight weeks is fine. It's not. It all depends on the density how many horses you have on your property and if you have a lot of horses eating all close together you have to be dewormed more frequently a horse naturally deworms itself by eating here and then migrating over there all day and then eating over there and defecating someplace else and then tomorrow be eating someplace else and defecating someplace else and a week from now being a hundred miles away from where you started today that's how horses deworm themselves. They don't eat where they defecate. They keep migrating. But the problem is we have a fence around our horses. And I kind of uh, laugh when I, when I hear a whole bunch of people say, hey, I, I don't want to use chemicals in my horse. And I want to stay natural. And I say, well, great. Take your fences down, and that's being natural. Of course, that just doesn't work in this day and age. We have to keep our horses housed. So we have to do something about keeping our environment clean. And I'll get into that in just two seconds. Another thing is about fecal tests. 
They're bad for two reasons. One, they don't often show the shedding horse because if a horse is in shedding, he may all uh, be infected with parasites, but it's not going to show on the fecal test. And two, when a fecal test is positive, it means that the horse already has a problem. And we don't want to be waiting until that problem occurs. Now, the reason why fecal tests are being pro um, promoted now and strategic deworming is the key phrase that people are using now. Wait till you have a fecal test that's positive and then deworm them is because we're starting to see some resistance to these parasite uh, medications. They've only been around since the mid-1970s. We didn't really have good chemicals and, uh, up before then, but we've been deworming a lot and we're getting uh, uh, rely ourselves on these medicines and these medicines are starting to fail us just like antibiotics are starting to fail us because you start to use them too often. So if you have a parasite problem I recommend deworming once a week for three weeks with ivermectin. That's something you can write down. I've been using that for probably two decades now. It never hurts a horse and if you think you have a problem like if you see worm hairs, those long hairs underneath the horse's neck, those will drop out after the second deworming and you'll see an amazing improvement in your horses. But I want to show you what's a better deworming control and this is really important because Every article I've been reading about doing fecal tests and strategic deworming and what you should be using for deworming never shows you this. And this is a wheelbarrow and a manure fork. And there's a pile of manure and this woman keeps her wheelbarrow out there and she goes out there throughout the day and picks up all the piles and puts them in there and carries them away. That is parasite control right there. I want to show you another farm that I came across. These are three pictures. On the left hand side, the tall picture, you'll see a shovel that has a home on the post of this fence line. And if you look at the upper right hand picture, the long picture with the horse in it, if you look carefully, you can see that every third or fourth post there is a shovel as far as you can see the length of this fence. And then the lower picture on the bottom is, a, is an active pasture with horses in it and it's spotless. That's parasite control. That's how you take care of horses, especially if you don't want to use any chemicals. That works the best. And finally, if you've got a little bit of money, you can get this manure vacuum. And these things work really well. These are commercial available kits or, or devices that you can buy. You can just pull behind your tractor, you start up the little motor, and you can suck in all the manure. Um, there's several different varieties out there. I'm sure on eBay you can find them. Uh, on my website, The Horse's Advocate, that's a shameless plug. I'm going to start telling you about The Horse's Advocate, which is my website that I put together with all this information that you go to all the time. It's a huge resource. But on there, I have a PDF instruction booklet of how to take a leaf blower and turn the leaf blower or you know what you use to blow your barns out of all the manure you can turn that into a manure vacuum and these people put it on their electric cart and I know she's listening to this she said she's gonna be here and, and I bet she's saying oh that's me I know it thanks Marilyn I appreciate it so much but um, they even clean their stalls with this instead of using a fork they just suck up all the piles and it's gone uh, and it's a really handy way of doing this so that's what I, I say um, uh, deworming is, is basically clean the paddocks. All right, so that takes care of my first two questions. I'm at 7.15, and I better pick up the pace because I've got a lot more things to talk about. But a lot of you guys don't know who I am. Everyone knows me as Doc T. Um, uh, Matt has, says that there's two questions coming in. So let me go over and find out what those two questions are. Um, what about daily deworming supplements and after three weeks of deworming do you wait six months to do it again? Great. Okay. <clears throat> daily deworming. I love daily deworming. Uh, when you have a, a horses that are turned out on a limited pasture, in other words, you have a closed environment where you don't have horses coming and going, um, that's really a, a good way to handle parasites. When you're in an open herd, and that's like a boarding barn where you have tons of horses that come and go all the time, and they bring in horses from some place unknown, and they dump parasites.
basically um, I, what I was trying to say was um, if your herd is closed, in other words, you don't have horses coming and going, you can um, you can use the de daily dewormer really effectively, but and and not worry about parasite resistance because you really aren't bring in a lot of horses, it's a closed herd and you wipe out the parasites and you're good. It's the herds that have a lot of horses coming and going that's a little bit more difficult. And those are the ones that you want to do once a week for deep three to cut the, the, the amount down. And then what I recommend, especially in a dense population, is once a month. If it's the first of the week, Sign them up and just, you know, at the first of the month, the, you know, July 1st, August 1st, September 1st, just deworm them. And I'll tell you another secret. If your horse weighs 1,000 pounds and you stick 1,200 pounds worth of dewormer in, that's great. You're not going to have a problem. But if your horse is 1,200 pounds and you only put 1,000 pounds dewormer in them, it's not going to work. It, you have to do at least how much they weigh. And, and, and don't shortchange them. Uh, if you put it in their mouth and they spit it on the ground, you have not dewormed them. So if you're going to deworm them, you need to do it effectively. And that's, uh, that's the best way I, I, I'll go over that. I have a whole slew of this, this closed herd, open herd thing uh, on a video on the Horses Advocate. Uh, so you can get into that. And, and when you do become a member of the Horses Advocate, you can join a Facebook user group, which is private which is, means only us that are in this group can see the questions and we can generate all these discussions and we can really go into deworming in a, in a, a bigger way. But I want to get uh, going here because we have so many other questions. Um, okay, who am I? Uh, I've been with horses since 1973, uh, which at this point is like 42 years. I uh, graduated from Cornell's Vet School in 1984. I've worked exclusively with horses as a veterinarian, but in 1998, I limited my practice just to equine dentistry. Uh, my practice covers approximately 10 states uh, where I visit thousands of different horses at hundreds of different barns every year. Uh, just a little tidbit. Um, I've been counting how many horses I've floated, and I'm up to approximately 63,000 floats that I've done. So what's really interesting is I've noticed one thing. It's so obvious. When things come into a pattern, and I see them over and over and over again, I start to see a, a, a the pattern. And it doesn't matter what sport you have, what breed you have. These are the things that come through, and that's what I want to get across. I also see that horse owners are very confused about basic husbandry knowledge. A hundred years ago, everybody had to know something about horses because we our, our lives revolved around them. Now they're more just RVs parked in the garage that we go and visit uh, and do our sport with and put them away. And the whole thing of caring for a horse has been moved away and that's what I'm trying to uh, bridge. I want to bring common sense horse husbandry back into the uh, spotlight so we can become better stewards or better advocates for our horses. So that's what I want to do. And I do that through the equine practice. That's my business. And if you go to theequinepractice.com, you can see that on the second line there. Um, I wish we could uh, have a way you could uh, get all this, but if you could just jot that down, theequinepractice.com, you won't have to write down any of the website. That's the one, because when you go there, you're going to see all my other businesses. First is horsemanship dentistry. It's something that Melissa and I have been doing uh, together. She's been with me for six years. She's uh, about to do her 10,000th float, which makes her a true outlier, if you know anything about the book Outliers. It means that she's beyond just good at this. She's uh, an expert at it. And this is a horse that's not drugged, standing out in a field, who's actually enjoying the process. And that's our claim uh, to fame in our dentistry business. We use horsemanship skills. And I want to encourage any of you that are listening to this, that have never seen this, to go to horsemanshipdentistry.com. You can get there through the equinepractice.com and watch the videos of us working. Uh, you'll be amazed by it and read the testimonials of people who see us work. Uh, Melissa and I just yesterday did five brand new clients with five brand new horses and they're all so moved. They sent us thank you notes and everything. They said we've never seen anything like it. And we are effective. We get the back teeth, we get every tooth, we dress it so all the pain is removed from the horse's mouth. Um, anyway, 
uh, I'd love for you to check it out. And if you want to contact us for um, a dentistry appointment, just write down the word teeth and put it in the chat room and Matt will grab your email and he'll make sure that you get more information about what we do with teeth. But um, just write in teeth. That's a great little catch word that you can put in there. It takes you no time to write that. I also have uh, started to teach this online. Equine Dentistry School Online is to help people throughout the world learn our technique of equine dentistry. And I use videos and, and photographs and whiteboard presentations uh, to teach people everywhere. Um, I've got students uh, not just in the United States, I've got one over in Australia and a graduate in the Dominican Republic right now. So that's really cool and I'm excited about preserving this style of dentistry. And the Horses Advocate, uh, which is thehorsesadvocate.com, is the thing that I'm trying to bring to you through this these webinars is to teach you basics. Here's a whiteboard presentation I did a couple of years ago about elbow lock, which is a fold presentation um, where the fold gets stuck because his elbow is locked and you can get take care of that. You don't need to call the veterinarian. You don't have time to call the vet. You can get this fold unstuck and have a fold out within minutes of unsticking them uh, through this little uh, video that I've done on Elbow Lock. It was one of my most uh, popular ones that I had on um, uh, YouTube. And then, of course, I've got my store, which I have my book here called Since the Days of the Romans. If any of you guys want to become a, a veterinarian or an equine veterinarian and want to know how I got there, uh, my story is a little bit different. I ended up um, dropping out of college because I couldn't stand it. Turns out that I had trouble learning how to read or learning because I had trouble reading. Uh, but I spent five years on a thoroughbred breeding and training farm. I learned all my horsemanship skills there and all my hus husbandry skills steeped in tradition. And I brought them back to Cornell where I finished my undergraduate. And I started something called the I Love New York Horse Symposium back in 1979. And I had 500 people arrive to my first symposium that I put on, uh, my wife and I put on together. Um, and we just have been teaching ever since then, 1979. That's a long, long time teaching. Uh, and this is my story of how I got here. All right, that's enough about me. Let's go on to some of these, these other questions. Uh, this question, EPM, which stands for equine protozoal myelitis. I should have written that out, but I didn't. Uh, it's just a long name for a bug that gets inside horses and wrecks havoc in the nervous systems. Um, she says, symptoms discussion. Uh, mentally, specifically, is my question. I have a few EPM horses here, some treated before coming, some not. All share strange similarities, not just gates. The one thing about EPM is, well, there's two things. First, back in the 80s, we didn't know what it was. We had no clue of what was causing it other than we knew it was a protozoa. We finally were able to identify that protozoa, and it suddenly became more prevalent. It just seems to be everywhere. Uh, horses, you know, everybody here on this webinar has probably met a horse that has it. Well, what happens is these little bugs, which are not bacteria and not viruses, but they're a protozoa, which is, a, which is an organism, set up somewhere in the nervous system. And they can set up anywhere. And it depends on where they set up that determines what they cause, what lameness they cause, what soreness they cause. And what's really interesting is it's very hard to diagnose these things because when you do a blood test and the blood test comes back positive, it means your horse has had that problem long enough to mount an immune response, and that immune response is what you're testing for. So your horse has had it for two to four weeks already, and that means the damage has already been occurring. So a lot of these horses go on the EPM medication, uh, the one approved for use is Marquee, and they treat it, and I kind of call it a Marquee deficiency, because when you, these horses get it, their symptoms seem to go away. But as far as mental, I'm going to guess that a lot of these horses are very concerned about how they're feeling, and I think a lot of them know that there's something wrong, and they just can't figure it out figure it out. It's a weakness. Uh, there's a, 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 a gate that suddenly isn't working right. So there's a lot of questions about EPM. It's a little bit more extensive than I can answer here. And I think there's too many unanswered questions for me to 
come forward and say, here's the problem. But I do know that it's affecting more horses now. I know that it's very effective treatment in the marquee. There are other treatments out there that are not FDA approved uh, but seem to work just fine. And if your horse has it once, even if you treat it, there's a good chance it'll come back again. And there are vectors, meaning there are intermediate hosts. Uh, the brown cowbird is one of them, and the possum is the other. So I think it goes back to cleanliness and making sure that your hay is kept away from possums and birds so they don't get their feces because it's the feces of these animals that get into the food and the horse eats it, and that's how the horse gets the disease. So again, it all goes back to cleanliness and cleaning up your, your pastures. So uh, unfortunately, I don't think I answered this one really well, but I think it's just a little bit too broad a question for the scope of this presentation. Uh, which brings me to another question. Uh, she wants to talk about flappy gums, and I call it flabby cheeks, F-L-A-B-B-Y, cheeks. Um, and it's just something that I came up with that I found in dentistry. And I think a lot of people who have horses that put bits in the mouth should know about this. Here's the thing. One picture is worth a thousand words, and here's the picture. Now, this is annotated, and you can see the arrows coming out of the word uh, flabby cheek edge. And this is a massive amount of, of fleshy, fatty tissue that lies right on the bar of the mouth, right where the bit goes. And you can see the tooth in the background. That's the first bottom cheek tooth. And the flabby cheek is draped over the first lower cheek tooth. In fact, when I pulled that back, there's an actual sore on the cheek. Now, half the horses I see doing dentistry have flabby cheeks. Now, half of those actually don't care. So just to put it in terms of percentages, 75% of the horses I see, on roughly speaking, either don't have flabby cheeks or could care less that they have them. But the remaining 25%, that means one in four horses that have this, really don't like the bit in their mouth. And one thing is, um, there's a couple things that I've learned from this. Number one, you should use the thinnest diameter bit possible because the thin diameter bit prevents that mass from pushing back and pinching this between the first and second cheek tooth. Second, uh, try to round the first cheek tooth up so it's not pointed like the bow of the Titanic. We want to turn in the shape of the bow of the tugboat. And third, start riding with your seat and not with your hands. In other words, get your hands out of the horse's mouth. Now this particular horse that you're seeing right now was one of the few horses that have flabby cheeks that needed to be drugged to get the teeth done. I could float anywhere in the horse's mouth, but as soon as I started floating the first bottom cheek teeth, this horse turned inside out, couldn't stand it. He was so scared. Here's another picture of flabby cheeks. And you can see a, t uh, a thumb being pressed down and pushed back. And this is a test that you should do on every horse that you own. Uh, but be careful. If your thumb goes too far back, the horse can bite you. And I don't want to hear about it from you if you stick your thumb in too far. I just want you to put your thumb in where the bit goes, not where the teeth are. And I want you to push down on the, on the bar and then push backwards. And if there's a wave of tissue that comes back and starts to wave over that first cheek tooth, then you know your horse has flabby cheeks. And if your horse puts up an objection to this, then your horse may have one of those, be one of those horses that needs a little bit special care. Here's another picture on the left-hand side, the tall picture. You can see, again, the thumb is being pressed down and pushed back against the first cheek tooth. And on the right-hand side, on the uh, landscape picture, you can see the first cheek tooth is rounded up beautifully. It's like the bow of the tugboat. So when that, those flabby cheeks comes back over it, it has a place to escape. It's not going to be pinched. A lot of people call this the bit seat, but nobody, it seems, is able to tell you why we do a bit seat. And now I've just explained it to you. It's for flabby cheeks. Okay, we're at the halfway mark. It's 7.30, and I've gotten through four questions, and I've got a lot more to go. So I'm going to really pick up the pace here. And I know I'm going to go fast. Just take your pens and papers and start scribbling down notes, and then just you know shoot me an email later on and say, hey, I didn't get this, or you know explain that a little bit more. But I want to uh, get into some.
son just said that I um, I cut out on the audio and I'm not too sure where I was maybe you can tell me where I was when I cut out but here the question is about helping a horse stay calm when you expose them to other things and I gotta tell you in my opinion dealing with the thousands of horses tens of thousands of horses that I've worked with it's you remaining calm because what I found is horsemanship is leadership and I have a small book called the 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship that if you go to the equinepractice.com and go to the store you can see that it's a small book I wrote it's everything I use to make sure um, okay Marilyn says my sound went at 731 is my sound back and anybody can tell me my sound is back yes great okay so horsemanship is leadership and horsemanship is so important because um, um, once you get control of your energy and you become a leader the horse is more willing to do what you want them to do the definition of a leader is empowering those around you to do um, better to to do more to be more than what they are alone that's what a leader does what we find what we do with our horses is, is we try to teach them we try to guide them we try to beat them now, hopefully not but you know force them uh, get frustrated with them but we're all looking at them and I find and this is not a simple answer but it really is a simple concept to the question once you learn how to become a leader you can lead your horse to do things it didn't think he could do so stop looking at the horse as the problem and look at yourself and the ten irrefutable laws of horsemanship the first four are just physical contact but the last six laws are one uh, become a leader and two uh, know the personalities of your horse uh, because you can't be a leader unless you know who you're leading because Socrates said that the horse or humans are made up of four different personalities and I think you know them one is the demanding dominant dictatorial do it my way or get out of my way bully type uh, personality another personality is woohoo it's a party uh, where's my spotlight it's the stage is on I'm gonna start dancing for you this is fun a third personality is I'm not moving one step until I know exactly what I'm doing I have to make sure everything's in order and once I know they're in order I'll do what's said and don't add anything to that list that's the type of horse that's out there on the trail ride and everything seems to be going fine until the bird flies up and he says that was not on the list I don't know how to handle myself and every horse wants either to have a leader around them and if they're not finding a leader around them they will become the leaders and I gotta tell you most horses are lousy leaders alright so if you develop your leadership skills and these horses buy into your leadership they will be led beautifully and the fourth uh, uh, um, personality is the phlegmatic one where he says yeah whatever you know you want to go there fine I'm good it's like if I ask you where do you want to go to lunch you say I don't care uh, you can't make decisions it's really not important just life is good and just gonna move on they're bomb proof types okay so um, get the ten irrefutable laws of horsemanship read that learn it uh, come on board with the horses advocate because I think that's a huge thing that we all can talk about and learn to become better leaders because uh, once we do we can become better horsemen and then you can take all the horses that you've got and expose them to different things and they will turn to you and say what do I do and you're gonna say we're gonna move forward or we're gonna run because it's a 10-foot alligator and I'm out of here and and they will follow what you say oh that actually was a really great question I love that question as soon as I saw it and I could spend the rest of this seminar on that but I can't because so many other people have questions here this is a double question um, from a man who has two horses one a mare 31 and her son who's 21 and they had bad breathing problem last year and I want to prevent it again from happening this year they have to press real hard and force air out of their lungs to me that description is allergic bronchitis that's moved into something called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or HEAVES. Uh, 
Anyway, they were given um, uh, dexamethasone orally for three months um, and eventually it subsided. And due to this, they both lost a lot of weight. And her 21 year old has bounced back, but the mare still is about 150 pounds underweight. The questions are what can I do to prevent this breathing problem? And the second question is how can I keep my horse's mare's, uh, the mare's weight back up? So let me approach these two different things. Okay, we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is also known as COPD. You see that on commercials on TV. Uh, you hear it about, uh, amongst the barns. You also have allergic bronch bronchitis, which is the um, precursor to it. And there's dozens of other names. But here's the bottom line. There are allergies out there, allergens, that cause the air tubes to spasm closed. Um, they swell and they shrink up and air can't get through them. Now, it's fascinating if you watch any of these post-mortem you know, crime shows and you're in the post-mortem room and they said the man uh, was dead before he was thrown in the water. Well, how they can tell this is because in our relaxed state, in the most relaxed state we've got is dead, we are in full inhalation mode. In other words, it takes no effort to inhale, but it takes effort to exhale. So it, it requires a push of the muscles. And when these airwaves close down, we have to actually push um, I see Susan said bad echo again. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting here in the room. It's all about the internet waves uh, and how it goes through the, and it's just a miracle the thing works at all. So hopefully the echo is going away. I just gave it a pause. Maybe that will help. But as the horse tries to push the air out, they actually build their abdominal muscles to the point where they develop what's called a heave line. And, they tr and, and, and it's frustrating because nothing stops these guys. The best thing is to remove the allergen, but here's the problem. Um, Susan still has a bad echo. Um, I don't know what I can do from it on this end. I'm not changing anything. Maybe uh, you can mute and then come back and see. Um, or make sure your microphone's turned off. Sometimes there could be some feedback that way. Uh, and okay, some other people say that it sounds great. Good, so I'll just keep moving on. Susan, I hope you can fix that or turn your volume down a little bit um, and see if we can prevent some feedback going on there. Um, allergens stack up. Let's put it this way. If you have one thing that's an allergy causing substance in you, your body can handle it. But then you throw on two or three or four, your body can handle it. Then you go to 50, 100 allergens. And then all of a sudden, 101 comes along and bam, you've got a problem. Now, these are usually caused by something in the air that's getting into the lungs. But there are three types of allergens. There's contact. And you know what contact is, is you wipe some chemical on the horse's body and all of a sudden they have hives, you know, just where you wipe it. You have ingestion and anybody with a peanut allergy know what, knows what that's like or a uh, shellfish they eat something and boom they have an allergy and then there's inhalants and these are caused by allergens being breathed in pollen and it gets into your respiratory system and it responds I used to get a lot of horses coughing in the springtime in upstate New York where the uh, pardon me where the sap started running in the maple trees and they start to collect the sap to, to make maple, maple syrup. And when that started, I would get phone call after phone call about my horses starting to cough. And the cough would be what I call a productive cough, where the horse would lower his head down, shake, stick it out, and I, I hate to do it on here because this might not come across well, but they go, <clears throat> and, they, and then they lick their lips because they, you could hear the phlegm coming up. It was in their mouth, and they would swallow it. That's what we call a productive cough. And it would usually occur either 
first thing in the morning when you open up the barn doors and you rattle the feed buckets around, they all got excited and all the horses start going, <laughs> you know, they start nickering and they start breathing harder and all the pus that accumulated overnight in their lungs would all coalesce and come up the trachea and hit their cough mechanism and they go, <clears throat> and they cough it up. Another time is as you start riding and you kind of, you know, take your heels on the side of the horse and ask him to get going, and that's making him move, and that physical movement would release all those allergen pus, pustules. They'd coalesce, they'd come up, and the horse would rip the reins out of your hand as the head goes straight down to the ground, and they'd cough out this chunk of, of, of phlegm. That progresses into chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, and these horses just sit there, and they're trying to breathe desperately. And number one, the thing, um, thanks Marilyn, I sound funny, great. Um, the thing is, um, if you try to remove the allergen, um, you're going to have to remove a ton of allergens. You can't remove the pollen that's in the air. The bales of hay that you just got that you spent a lot of money on, they're going to have some dust in there. You have the dust in the barn you can't get rid of. What truly works is putting a horse in a... Uh, climate sealed room with an air conditioner on and take out all the pollens and dust and that will work uh, but second to that you wait until the season goes and this person who asked the question said after three months it finally went away what probably wasn't the steroid it was that the allergen was gone and you moved into a new season because these things are usually seasonal not always but usually so the treatment for COPD includes removing the cause and or steroids. And st <laughs> Joyce says, love the sound effects. Great. Anyway, um, the, um, the steroids actually um, suppress the immune system. And there are two steroids that use. One is prednisone and the other is dexamethasone. And they're the same drug except prednisone is one-tenth the concentration. So it takes 10 prednisones to equal one dexamethasone. Dexamethasone works great. You put them on it. It cuts the coughing. They can breathe again. Fantastic. Problem with dexamethasone is in many, many horses, you can create laminitis, which will uh, drastically affect the horse's life and even cause the, the horse to die from laminitis. I personally know this because I had a horse with heaves and it bugged me. I couldn't get rid of it. I tried everything from acupuncture uh, to um, uh, Chinese herbs to uh, prednisone to uh, inhalers, bronchodilators, uh, the, the mask that I would put on. I tried everything and nothing seemed to help this horse except dexamethasone, which caused him to have laminitis. And finally, after 18 months of treating the horse, um, we ended up euthanizing him because nothing worked. Uh, COPD is life-threatening in some of these horses, but I would recommend prednisone because you can adjust that. And once you find the maximum dose that helps these horses, you can reduce the, do the dose of prednisone to every other day treatment and reduce the amount of prednisone you give to what's minimum. And I've kept horses on that for years with no adverse effects because prednisone has to go to the liver and be converted over to prednisolone and then it becomes active and that seems to buffer the horse and prevents them from getting laminitis. So that's my two bits on that. Again, I'm sorry I have to go so fast, but here it is quarter to eight and I still have a lot more to go. So weight loss in horses. There are four things that cause weight loss in horses. Number one is starvation. That's abject starvation where nobody brings food for the horse and there's nothing there for them to eat or the teeth are so bad that the horse can't chew, uh, they're, uh, the horse is missing teeth and you're feeding him long stemmed hay and he just sits here and looks at it and even though you're feeding the horse, the horse isn't getting the food in there and a third case of starvation which is very sad but it's happened twice now in my career is that the owner was buying grain and hay for their horse in a boarding stable and and the person who owned the stable was taking that food and feeding their own horses and was not feeding the horse that the owner was buying the food for. So that was criminal starvation. But starvation is number one. Um, um, I got your message, Matt. I'll take care of that. Um, parasites is the number one uh, cause of weight loss as far as I'm concerned. And we already...
went over to that deworm once a week for clean full, and, and they and they spend all their energy into trying to move their weight and shift it around. And finally, disease. Something organic is going on, a cancer, a liver failure, but those are very rare in a horse. But I do want to touch on something here. Um, your horse is 31 years old, and horses that are older, late 20s, early 30s, their immune system is not as good as a, a middle-aged horse, and their immune system is important for taking care of parasites inside the horse's body. So I would deworm that her, horse once a week for three weeks with ivermectin just to remove parasites as a cause of problems because you know you aren't starving the horse, and the parasites may be um, something that will help uh, this horse gain weight, especially as winter time comes. I doubt if it's the dexamethasone that caused the problem. If the horse is still having a lot of heaves and is spending all their time just trying to breathe, uh, that could fall into the chronic pain category where the horse is constantly exerting a lot of effort. And I'll throw out another thing in here. Most of you who know me know um, that um, I don't like grain. I'm against feeding grain to horses, it, and it's not going to be brought up in this webinar except me mentioning it right now. But if you have a horse that has some sort of allergies that can't breathe right, I would recommend you eliminate all grain and just stick to pasture and some good clean hay and see if that helps. Because I have a feeling that a lot of horses that get grain in their intestines sets up inflammation down there and leads to clonic ulcers of varying degrees. And the horse is battling inflammation as it tries to keep the food that you're putting down this into the intestines out of the body. That could be a cause of stress for a horse. So I think if you have a horse that has chronic weight loss and heaves and other signs of uh, immune deficiency, uh, I would deworm once a week for three weeks ivermectin, and I would look at uh, decreasing grain uh, even though that doesn't make sense in a horse that's losing weight. But you have to get rid of that idea that grain actually adds weight to a horse. In a lot of horses, it actually causes inflammation. Because I want you to think just for a second, when you stick food inside your mouth and swallow it, it is not inside your body. You've placed it in a tube running through your body that has a solid wall. And everything you stick in there, the steak and potatoes or their vegetarian diet or the Coca-Cola or the coffee, has to be broken down into molecules and be transported across a solid barrier before it can be brought into your body and put to use. And that movement of these particles across the body are either welcomed, as in water and vegetables, or are not welcomed as in sugar, and sugar can actually set up inflammation and the horse can actually lose weight as you feed them more grain. So those are two things that um, I want you all to know. I've got to put in a warning right now. I am not treating your horse. I don't have the right to treat your horse because I haven't seen your horse. I can give you general principles and that's what this is all about. When I see weight loss in a horse, I look for starvation, I look for parasites, I get remove that as a cause, I look for chronic pain and that could be chronic inflammation in the hind gut, so grain could be a cause of that and finally I'll move into some sort of disease which includes old age. A 31 year old horse that um, is 31 years old and a lot of these times they're just reaching the end of their life which is something we don't like to face but it could be another reason for chronic weight loss in the horse. And of course, don't forget to look at the teeth. That goes in the starvation category. Make sure the teeth are comfortable so the horse is eating well. For some older horses that don't seem to be doing well and taking them off grain, they tend to lose more weight. I like Cool Stance. Now, I know the people who uh, own Cool Stance saw my last webinar and they love me for pr uh, promoting them. Uh, it's coconut flakes. And coconut is a medium chain triglyceride, which is a fat. And fat can be a good source of energy in these horses. It's also incorporated in something called Renew Gold. So, write those things down Cool Stance and Renew Gold. And you can try that as an, another source of uh, energy for your horses. All right, so hopefully that's a little tidbit that'll help you. If you have a horse that you're doing everything for and they're still losing weight, uh, you might want to try that. 
proud flesh. This is great. Uh, specifically on a knee joint, hours of study, vet opinions, and innumerable purchases, bandaging, etc. Uh, and it's just frustrating for a lot of people. It's a long question, uh, but let me just get right to it so we don't waste time. We have to understand the cause of proud flesh, but let me, before I get to it, tell you what proud flesh is. Oh, uh, Marilyn just asked about uh, supplements, uh, vitamins, uh, Triple Crown Senior, um, uh, and if you're going to take your horse off grain, you have to look carefully at everything that, that you're feeding the horse. Supplements are loaded with grain. I love Strongin C as a daily dewormer, and yet that's loaded with corn. Even the red mineral salt block has corn in it. Uh, corn syrup. So all these things can be inflammatory. So if you want to do anything, just get a calendar, circle the date you start, and remove everything but grass, you know, the pasture, and hay. And just see what happens over the next two weeks as far as your horse goes. And again, in this older horse, you might want to go with a new gold. Uh, Bobby is watching. She says that um, she's seen some super results with a new gold. And I've got to agree with her. So get them off the corn, get them off oats, get them off wheat, wheat middlings, get them off all grains, including rice bran, wheat bran, all of that stuff, and feed the horse the way the horse was made. A horse was made to eat nothing but forage. And if you have to supplement, I would try Renew Gold uh, because it seems that we're getting really good results with that for these really difficult horses, especially the 31-year-old horse. Okay, let me go back to this proud flesh. Um, when a horse gets a cut, that's what I call a full thickness skin cut, below the knee or below the hock, not above the knee and hock, but below, and the skin edges pull apart, those edges should be sutured back together to prevent proud flesh. Proud flesh is nature's way of bandaging up the wound. It is in uh, a, what they call granulation tissue. It covers the wound, and then the skin heals over the top of that. If you want an idea of what it looks like, think of the Superdome or one of these football arenas where the roof can open and close. It opens and closes on a structure, and the roof closing is the skin, and the structure is the granulation tissue, and the skin is supposed to go over the granulation tissue and close up all on its own. The problem is when the skin can't come together, the granulation tissue continues to grow and it becomes exuberant. And that's why they call it exuberant uh, granulation tissue or what we horsemen call proud flesh. The problem is once this proud flesh grows tall, then the skin edges can't get around it. The, the, the superdome can't close because there's stuff in the way. Um, so. Um, I just I'm just looking at the comment about um, feeding um, something called 13 slash 8 by Midwest. Unfortunately, I'm not too sure what that is, but I'm recommending that if there's any grain in the horse in, in that feed, you might want to consider um, uh, moving over to the Renew Gold and see if Renew Gold will help. And also be sure to deworm um, uh, that horse because she's 31 years old and make sure the parasites are not being a bother. Uh, Rich, if you want to reach out to me later on and talk about that a little bit more, that's fine. But let me keep moving on with this uh, proud flesh. All right, so what causes proud flesh? It's prevention of the skin coming together. And number one is movement. And the question was, what do you do about proud flesh in, the, in, the, in a joint? The most common place to get it is in the inside, the front of the hock. And that usually is a horse that brings his leg backwards over a wire and comes forward. The wire gets caught right there in front of the hock, and it rubs and it cuts. And finally, the horse gets out or breaks the wire, but the cut's there. If you want to stop proud flesh, you're going to do what I'm going to tell you to do in the next slide. But I'm right now, I'm going to tell you what causes it. Because once you understand what causes it, then you'll understand how you can prevent it. So movement is number one. So that's a bugger when it's on a joint. There's hardly anything you can do about that. Scrubbing, any kind of scrubbing with any kind of soap kills all those skin cells that are trying to come over and close up.
Now remember, if granulation tissue is occurring, then the wound is no longer open. You're beyond that phase. It's like nature's bandage. Nature's trying to bandage it up and keep the dirt out of the wound so it covers it with this granulation tissue. Now, phase two is to bring the skin over the top of it. But what we do in our nurturing ways is we scrub with a, a gauze, with cotton, uh, with betadine, uh, with peroxide, with all sorts of things, and we're destroying those cells that are trying to come across. And that's the number one reason why we cause proud flesh in these horses. So stop scrubbing, stop using soaps, stop using gauze in bandaging these things. Because what happens is when you take the bandage off and the um, and you peel the gauze off, you rip all those healthy tissues off, all, all the tissue out. All those healthy cells are gone, and now the, the granulation tissue just bubbles up higher, and now you've got a problem. And for all of us who put ointments on, ointments block the movement of the, of the skin and, and prevent the closure. So movement, scrubbing, soaps, gauze, and ointments are the reason why we have proud flesh. So what can we do about that? I forgot to put in number one here before decreased movement. Get on top of it before it happens. Proud flesh is usually comes from neglect or delay in getting to this. So check your horse out all the time for any sort of cuts, and if they do, clean it up. Go ahead, go to town, scrub the heck out of it using baited iron and whatever, because you must make that wound clean. And in fact, there's a three-hour rule. If you can get to a cut, whether it's on your hand and finger or on a horse, and you get to it within three hours and, and clean it, and then prevent dirt from getting into it, you're miles ahead of the game. You've stopped the infection. But after three hours, so if it gets cut in at night and you don't see it till noon the next day, you're behind the eight ball because bacteria have already started to, to invade the tissues and you're behind. You, it's almost impossible to scrub it. But you're going to try to remove all the dirt, all the pebbles, all the crap that's in there, manure. Get that all out because you want a clean environment as possible, and you may have to put the horse on antibiotics at this moment, but try and get that infection down. Decrease movement. Now, that's impossible. It's just impossible. I don't know how you stop a horse from moving, moving, but just put that in the back of your mind. If you've got a cut where there's a lot of movement, then don't be exercising the horse for a week or 10 days. You know, the horse is moving around the stall fine, but don't take it over jumps or gallop the horse or things like that where you're going to be pulling those edges apart. If you have proud flesh that's already occurred, debulk it. That means go in there with a scalpel blade and cut off all that excess. And on the horse's advocate, another shameless plug for my website. I have the whole videotape of how to take that proud flesh off. I have pictures that show you how to do it. I have pictures that show you step by step how to take care of proud flesh. It is such an easy thing to do um, to take care of it. Even if it's bad, you can debulk it and start over again, which is really good. Never scrub the uh, these things after the first washing. Once you've scrubbed and cleaned it up, never do it again. Just a cold water hose gently going over. Don't use a pressure spray. You don't need that because that will destroy too. Gentle hosing. Uh, don't use any soaps. Um, always use a non-stick pad. I use Telfa pads but there's other brands out there. And spray a water soluble antibiotic on the pad. I use Furosin spray and just spray that on there. What that does is it kills the surface bacteria. And you, then you place, place that non-stick pad on the cut and then, then on top of that, put some gauze pads and then wrap that with some um, vet wrap. And the vet wrap will actually add pressure and gently push. I don't mean strangulate the leg, but just enough to add some pressure to keep that granulation tissue down and allow the skin uh, to come over the top of it. And then a really neat trick, and I show this all to you in the website of the Horse's Advocate on Proud Flesh, but you take elasticon and you seal the top end of that, uh, of the of the bandage, the uh, the um, non uh, non-stick stuff, um, vet wrap, and you seal the bottom, and you turn the horse out in mud, and that horse, I don't care how dirty and muddy the horse looks, when you take that bandage off two or three or four days later, and you peel it off, it's super 
It's crystal clean underneath, and that's how you take care of it. All right, I just love this. It's eight o'clock. Um, can anybody? Can everybody just take a moment and inundate me with a chat room? Does everybody want me to go a few more minutes, or or should I be wrapping it up now? I know Matt wants me to wrap it up. We want to keep this close to an hour. Um, all right. Um, I see that just about everybody is still here, so that means I still have you interested. Let me just do this one last question, if you don't mind, and then I want to tell you a little couple of things that, that you can take care of this. Okay, um, the question is, what is the percentage of total weight a horse can carry without undue stress on him? I had a trainer show up with a 64-pound saddle to break a 14-hand fillet. He was over 200 pounds. Uh, this was many years ago, and I sent him on his way, but I always was bothered by it. Well, I want you to think about something. What does an 80-pound anvil mean to you? I mean, I, I forgot to put the word anvil in here, but an anvil is what we all know a fair uses to you know, pound on, on shoes. And an 80-pound anvil, or 36 kilogram, or 5.7 stone, for all my buddies over in England who might be watching this, what does that mean to you? And I love the, the physics, law of physics, called F equals MA. That means force equals mass times acceleration. Now, let me explain this to you, because I know you guys say you want to um, uh, listen to this. I see all your comments saying, keep talking, yes, keep going. Um, but let me pretend I take this farrier's anvil and I gently, I mean gently, just place it on your foot. I'm, I'm standing in front of you and I just lower it and just gently place it on your foot. Now all of you I know feel the anvil, but you didn't pull your foot away because you trusted me and you say, okay, I can handle an 80 pound anvil on my foot. It's okay. But what happens when I drop that same anvil on your foot? That's force equals mass times acceleration. The mass hasn't changed. Whether that anvil is on the moon or you know someplace else, the mass is the same. What's different is acceleration, and that's gravity pulling it toward the earth. And when we lift it up two, three, four feet in the air and let go of it, it's heading toward your foot. I guarantee you're going to be moving your foot. All right? That's force equals mass times acceleration. Now, but... Um, Sorry to see you go, Susan, um, but uh, this will all be recorded, um, and I'll put this on uh, the website for all you guys who want to become members of the Horse Advocate. But uh, my point is, how heavy does a horse, you know, what weight can a, a horse take? And what I'm suggesting is for every 50, 80, 100 pounds that you put on the horse's back, whether it's in fat on the horse or the fat on you or the uh, equipment you put on them is a stress that's being put on every joint of that horse's body. Now, I want to ask you, if you've never seen an x-ray of a bone, I think you're, you've, you've missed something. I think we've all seen x-rays. Has anyone seen an x-ray where the bones look like I-beams or two-by-fours? They don't. They're curved, and they have little protuberances that stick out, and, and they, they look weird. But the reason they look weird is because stress applied to the bone will make its shape. So if you took the cannon bone of a horse and cut it right in half and look down on it, just like a dog bone, you'll see that the front half of the cannon bone is very thick and the back half of the cannon bone is very thin. The reason for that is the horse's weight is carried on the front side of the cannon bone, and due to something called piezoelectric currents, which is currents that are set up by stressing bones, it will attract more calcium, and calcium will be laid down there, and the bone is actually thicker. And where tendons and ligaments attach, they actually pull on the bone, and it sets up more of these currents, so it lays down more calcium, and you actually have these protuberances that help attach bones to tendons and bones to ligaments. That's how it works. So the question is, how heavy should it be? The answer is twofold. One, you should keep the minimum amount of weight on your horse because that just makes sense. You wouldn't want to strap a farrier's anvil on your back and go about your business all day. But on the flip side, if you did strap an anvil on your back and you slowly progressed over time, 
in a month or two or three months, you would become stronger and you would say, I can handle that. And all of us who carry the extra weight of the donuts that we eat in the morning are carrying that extra 10, 20, 30 pounds on our bodies, but we've carried it for so long that our bones and our joints have, accom have accommodated to that and we do well. But here's the problem. Now we take the horse that's accommodated to this weight and this training, and all of a sudden we up its game. We jump it over a, a fence, we take it around a barrel, we cut some cattle with it, or we do some uh, dressage movement that asks him to uh, change his uh, center of gravity. Now, that's putting a lot of stress. And we wonder, I wonder anyway, why suddenly we're having so many breakdowns of horses with suspensories uh, that it just seems like what kind of horse do you have if your horse hasn't had a suspensory? And I keep saying it's because you're not treating them like athletes. So number one, keep the weight down. Keep your horse trim. Keep it out of body condition score five if you really are want to keep this horse as an athlete. Don't get it a body condition score of seven, which means he's carrying hundreds of extra pounds. Keep yourself in condition if you want to start riding a horse and start using something I call LSD. And LSD is not a hallucinogenic drug. LSD is long, slow distance. And take your horse out and work that horse through it. Now, 100 years ago, we would take our horses to and from town every day, pulling our goods and our wares back and forth. And we would never ask that horse to compete except maybe on Sunday afternoon in the valley behind the church um, you know after church we would meet and we would compete our horses but our horses had to be sound to go back to work on Monday because that's their job but we don't do that with our horses we don't treat them like athletes we think we do but in reality if you want to really treat your horse like an athlete keep its condition down Keep the extra farrier's anvils off of his back and start conditioning the horse. Anyway, that's my little ditty on that. Here's thrush. I've got a whole thing on thrush in here. Um, uh, can a horse be autistic? That was a great question. I don't think I have a good answer on that. Leading horses into stall and, and um, having hip busted. Here's a horse with a knockdown hip. You can see uh, his busted hip is on the right side that you're looking at. It's his left hip. But you see how their asymmetry is there. Uh, that's his good hip and that's his bad hip because the horse went into stall too fast and he actually broke um, that point off his hip and the tendon uh, slipped off of it. Uh, here's a question about monocular vision uh, and the use of fly spray and I have a whole story about uh, don't worry, I'm not drunk, and my story about fly spray and how it can affect you. But those are some of the questions we have that I'd be happy to, to just keep working on uh, as time goes on at the next webinar. But I just want to remind everybody that if you like uh, what I've been talking about, uh, this is what I bring every time I come to a barn to do horsemanship dentistry. And if you'd like me to come do some horsemanship dentistry in your uh, farm, please um, just contact me through the horsemanshipdentistry.com. There's a, a, a form there. Uh, you can actually just say tooth, just say tooth or teeth or whatever uh, right now in the chat, and, um, and uh, Matt will make sure he contacts you. If you're interested in the school, there's that. But the Horses Advocate, that's, a, that's what I want to talk to you about. And if you go to thehorsesadvocate.com, and, and I should have a better website, um, uh, but if you look at this thing, it's thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash memberships forward slash membership overview. I messed up. My marketing crew is going to holler at me for not giving you a simple place to go to. But if you just go to the horse, Horses Advocate and go to memberships, you're going to see the overview, and there's a big bottom at the butt bottom. And I'm just giving this thing away for $9.99 a month. Um, and I would love, I mean, I would just absolutely love it if you guys want to just sign up for at least a month. Check out the website. It's a work in progress. I've got so much more work I've got to do on there, but I've got all the things I'm talking about are on there. I've got long toe, low heels, where I have Melissa jog and clown shoes to get that point across. I try to be as engaging as possible because I want everybody to learn. And also, you can become a, a member of the private Facebook group where we can actually talk to each other uh, on a, a regular basis. Um, 
but there's three types of memberships out there. There's annual memberships, but I just want to give this away. I want to get people on board here and see what I've got and, and have you guys write some testimonials and tell some other people about just how passionate I am. My mouth is so dry. My jaw is aching because I just love talking about this stuff. Uh, so just hit the big button on the bottom. It's $9.99 a month. You'll be charged automatically every month, but if you want to stop, you just say, whoa, I want to stop, and it ends there. But I think it's, it's well worth uh, what I'm giving you here. So anyway, that's me, uh, Jeff Tucker, uh, veterinarian since the days of the Romans, and that's going to be the end of this. Um, I love all of you um, doing this. Thank you, Matt, for putting that website up there. It's in the chat room so you can copy it. Um, and I hope every one of you learned uh, one thing at least. And Rich, I'll get in touch with you about teeth, and um, we'll get going on that. So sayonara, good night uh, from New York. I'll be back in Florida tomorrow, and I uh, love all of you. I really do. Thanks for stopping by. Take care.